families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Families Divided. Chris Turner completes her two-part series on mild, moderate, and severe alienation by speaking with you about the moderate and severe cases. Also on this segment, Lori and Vita will discuss with you how Vita, a grandmother who has not seen her granddaughter, her adult granddaughter, for six years, will have an opportunity to see her. And she will discuss that with you along with her daughter, Lori, who did not get to see her child. But I really want you to pay close attention to Vita towards the end of that segment. It's heartbreaking, but yet it tells you all you need to know about alienation. We'll have these things coming up right after these messages. In families dealing with alienation, communication during conflict is often very difficult. This fall, Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, will present a special in-person conference to address that very issue. Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills will be held September 9th through the 11th at the Marriott Research Triangle Park in Durham, North Carolina. You'll learn from experts how to master skills that can reduce anxiety, anger, and stress in alienation situations. Join event director Elaine Cobb, the founder and president of Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights, and conference moderator Dr. Colleen Murray as they present a lineup of highly respected experts, including keynote speaker Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, plus presentations by Bill Eddy, Megan Hunter, Dr. Joshua Coleman, Dr. Mark Mosk, Dr. Mary Alvarez, Dr. Sue Cornbluth, Shazia Sparkman, and Lisa Rothfuss. Mark your calendar now, September 9th through the 11th, for Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills, hosted by Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, Steel Partners Foundation, and PAICA, Parental Alienation is Child Abuse. Visit FamilyAccess.info for more details on the conference and secure your attendance. Seating is limited. At Victor's Crown, our focus is on you, our clients. When you arrive, our goal is that you will feel at home from our welcoming atmosphere to our serene surroundings. Everything we do at Victor's Crown is done with our clients in mind. We have comfortable seating areas for both adults and children. A large screen TV with surround sound where clients can be occupied with wholesome entertainment while they wait. We offer complimentary refreshments such as coffee, tea, water, and snacks. Due to the present COVID pandemic, our in-person appointments are restricted to selected cases. And those are held in our luxurious outdoor open air meeting space that we affectionately refer to as the COVID cabana, which was built specifically for our clients to offer them the most comfortable and relaxing outdoor space available. All our other clients are offered secured web-based telemed sessions where they can connect with us from anywhere in the world. Have you missed an episode of Families Divided? Please check out our YouTube channel. Not only will you find all the past episodes, but you'll also find additional content, including clips from our online webinars from experts in the field of parental alienation. Go to the link below, or you can find a link at familyaccess.info.
Last week on Families Divided, Christine Turner began her two-part series on mild, moderate, and severe cases of parental alienation. This week in part two, she discusses moderate and severe cases. And so for that moderate stage, you know, it's really important during those periods of possession when that child is acting out that they're short-lived, you know, trying to get through that and not making a big deal of those issues. Um, and that child will do things like go to the room and slam and it, no, the, anything that, that the target parent does isn't okay. And comparing that target parent to the way that the other parent works things. And some of the characteristics we see in that child that they won't easily greet the target parent. Maybe they'll continue to go on their periods of um, access and visitation with the target parent, but they, in a grumpy old mood, get into the car and just soak in there and won't, won't communicate or put their earbuds in all the time so that they are not having to communicate. They won't greet that target parent. They criticize everything about the target parent. The guilt in the child, which was present during that mild stage, is waning. It's not as obvious. They may have some tugs, they may be able to have some fun time, but they're immediately pushing themselves back into it and they're not feeling badly about it. The child begins to maintain some secrets about the favorite parent and they may start to use the we statements. They're, they're seeing themselves as fully aligned or aligned with that favored parent. And so we ask some, some of the kids, you know, sometimes who is that we? When it's a child says, we don't like you, we don't like it when dad does this. Who's we? Well, that's me and mom or me and dad, whoever that favorite parent is. So there's a, a meshing there of those two kind of feelings about that parent. Um, and they're speaking as one voice. The child begins to start to see the world dichotically, either all good or all bad. And in their world, that's the parent's world, right? So one parent is all good and one parent is all bad. And so they're looking for things to justify that during their times of possession with the target parent. If the target parent makes a mistake that normally would not be a big issue, say for example, he burns dinner or she burns dinner, the child will automatically say they always burn dinner and they're not a good cook, they can't do anything right in the kitchen. Whereas the favorite parent does everything right. And so those kind of um, good and bad become very black and white, very clear in, uh, to see in the child. We do believe that resetting that family and intervening um, still involves some education, maybe a little more uh, intensive, talking specifically about what's going on and targeting some of the things and naming them in the home about that education, about what that child feels, but making sure that the parents understand the effect they're having on their child um, through an educational process. Um, it's now during this time, although I'm not a huge favor of the litigation with these families because I think it escalates some of the behaviors, documenting um, regarding the parent's ability to integrate and act is really important and being able to see um, are the parents able to take the educational piece they had and put it into use in that documentation. It's extremely important that professionals involved know parental alienation. And it's imperative the third parties, be, when they become involved, and this is often the stage where the uh, litigation is escalating, the court case is escalating, or they've gone back to modify um, something in that based on the fact that this target parent is no good, um, that third parties become involved, such as an amicus attorney, a child a custody evaluator, a psychologist. And it's really important that they're able to see because as I'm sure you're aware, many of the things here are counterintuitive. Um, you know, just because a child says they don't want to see their father doesn't mean there's a good reason for that. It may be alienation. And if a professional is not um, educated about what parental alienation is and some of these signs and symptoms, they may disregard that um, and choose what the child is saying. Um, don't choose between the, between the children in these cases. It's a really important intervention. So if there are multiple children in a family, um, and I have one family right now where there are four children and three of the children have a good relationship. They are, sh are sh showing signs of mild alienation. The oldest child who's a teenager is showing signs of moderate alienation. And so she refuses to talk to the, the uh, target parent. She comes into the house, slams her door and goes to her room, tries not to communicate. It's 
don't let that that child make you choose between the other children. Um, it's very important that you continue to go ahead and tell the child that you care about them and relive some, some good memories you've had with them, keep them involved in the family, but don't put all the emphasis on trying to get that child back. You have other children that need to focus and life goes on. Some, some people who work on these interventions call that a, um, an NR, a non-response to that child that's acting out. That child is not severely alienated yet. So making sure that they're part of that family and participating, they're still coming on visits, make sure that they're part of that family with that target parent. A major misstep during that, mo that moderate stage of alienation in a family is just doing traditional therapy, thinking that this is just a parenting issue and we need to get parents and kids in together to talk about family th therapy. Um, if it's escalated to the point of moderate alienation, you really absolutely need someone who understands um, parental alienation and deals with that. Another misstep that parents take during this time is looking the other way or taking the high road, you know, being the better parent and just ignoring all of these behaviors. In terms of acting out behaviors, yes, ignore those from your child just as you would um, as a parent who's having a, a teenager who's aggressive or you know, a teenager who is um, being um, disgruntled right? Um, and setting a good example and catch them being good. But ignoring the fact that there's an issue or that there's alienation doesn't work. It's not going to go away. And so don't just look the other way or take the high road. And don't excuse the, the, the behavior of the child. It's just a phase they're going through or just their teenage years. Not holding the favored parent accountable during numerous opportunities for enforcement can be a problem letting it go and not accepting, you know, accepting the way things are going and allowing that to get ridden through the, the litigation system, maybe because you're torn down or you're worn down during this time period and your focus is on your children um, needs to not happen. So paying attention and making sure that though, that favorite parent is held accountable during areas that they're not, uh, things are not being enforced the way they should in terms of access and some of the other behaviors that they might be having. Let's talk last about the severe alienation. Um, and this is where whether or not this is a continuum or whether or not this is just, you know, moderate to severe because a parent is, has some ongoing mental health issues, um, the severe child persistently and adamantly rejects any contact with the target parent. And the favored parent is obsessed with destroying the target parent's relationship with the child. That is their goal. The child is a tool to be used to create some harm to that favored parent. The favored parent has no insight or willingness to consider that he she is poisoning the child against the target parent. They're not doing anything. And there's almost always an insistence that the child's coming up with all these ideas themselves. And that's between the favored, the target parent and the child. They need to fix that relationship. The favored parent is almost always meets some crit clinical criteria for personality disorder. And um, we've heard a lot about borderline and narcissistic behavior and all of those things. Sometimes it's important to get a psychological done at that time. Um, these cases are severe and need great intervention because what's happening with the child and some of the characteristics with the child during that time is that that child is fully rejecting the target parent while profusely praising the favored parent. We just talked about moderate levels where they're starting to see things as black and white. And now that black and white, that, that dichotomy between the good parent and the bad parent is clearly entrenched in that child. Um, the child is overly hostile and disrespectful and belligerent towards the par target parent with no guilt. Uh, that guilt is gone. The child is afraid. Um, there may have been situations where um, the favored parent has instilled in the, in the child a fear because they're dangerous. They can't be trusted around that child. And so there is some fear and um, they're trusting that favored parent's justification for that. The child feels entitled to behave badly towards that target parent. And they're aligned with the, fav the favored parent that everything that they've done is wrong. The child and the favorite parent use the same language and the same vocabulary. So many times you'll hear um, from the, the child the same phrases that you may have heard from the favored parent, either through court system or in person with your altercations or through that talking parent or family wizard type of app that they communicate. But you're hearing the same kind of things happening and the child is fully entrenched.
at this stage of the game, when families are involved in severe alienation, the intervention really needs to be a formalized program specializing in alienation. And many times that includes a swap in custody. So the target parent may get custody of that child, which is very difficult um, to make that transition without an intervention of a formal program. And there's a period of no contact with that favorite parent. Um, much like cult deprogramming, that child needs no contact with that favorite parent so that they can kind of get to phase zero where they actually can think for themselves and learn over a period of time that who that target parent says they are and were in the past is still the same person and erase some of those tapes that are constantly in, in their mind. Very difficult in many states for those in states and countries for uh, judges to, to buy into that swap in custody, um, but those formalized programs can help and there are many available. Major missteps that I see in this stage is after the target uh, favorite parent has attacked the target parent so much, um, a parent gives up. You know, there is nothing more valuable than a relationship between a parent and a child. And it's so hard to see when a parent gives up and um, when they have the attitude that I'm gonna let it go because it's just gotten so hard and they're destroying my current life and my current relationships. Um, when they're adults, when that child is an adult, they'll see it for itself. And I see lots of um, parents holding on to that hope. Very rarely have I seen that happen, has happened, but more often than not, it doesn't. Um, I have had a case where there were three children involved and mom in the middle of the night got up and took the kids, went to a new life, new house, husband in another state, dad didn't see the kids. And it grew and grew. And um, he gave up on two of his children and said, you know, they're old, they're, they're adolescents, I can't deal with them. Their behaviors are out of control in my home. I'm just gonna let them go and I'll deal with my younger child. And when they get older, they'll see this. Now, now the children are out of their adolescence now, they're now into their twenties and have children of their own and they still don't have a relationship with their dad. And it's a very sad thing. Um, losing perspective is another major misstep during this severe stage. There's a lot that the target parent has to do to make up that time and to do, and it, that costs money, time, may cost a focus of relationship on that child. But what's best for the child is for the child to have a relationship with both parents and working towards that is important. Um, a major, another major misstep as parents, even in the midst of these programs, um, make is not caring for yourself and degrading to the point of becoming what the other parent is alleging, right? So they may have said, your dad doesn't care, you know, and then dad gives up. Your dad or your mom um, is, is not available to you and they really don't want to be around you. Um, or perhaps, you know, it's led to you, you know, as a parent, as a target parent, having destroyed relationships or losing jobs and not able to maintain yourself uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. And so you've become a person that's a shell of the previous person. So taking care of yourself during that time through all of these is important, but especially as things escalate. And the last misstep I see people doing is assuming it's too late, that times are over, that they're defeated. It's very important during all of these stages that you don't give up on your ch children. Choose the child over the conflict. If you're the favored parent, seek help to discover what's at the center of the problem. Try to get help. Try to figure out what it is that's making you do this. It's hard for par favored parents to see that. Um, and over the time, they may have justified that this is the child's decision. If you're the target parent, trust your gut. Don't ignore the actions and interactions. Early on, at, the, at mild, moderate, or severe, wherever you are in that spectrum, if you're seeing signs that aren't okay, especially as parents separate and divorce or get some time and distance between parents, they may see things more clearly and act on it. Don't ignore them and don't ignore the actions and interactions. And keep yourself healthy, physically and emotionally and spiritually. Make sure that you're staying on top of things so that you can be the best parent you can be for your child. Choose the child over conflict at any stage. It's important. Thank you. Families Divided will return in a moment. Parental alienation is sad. 
When parents can't arrive at a solution amicably, it may be time to seek legal help for the sake of the children involved. In Florida, that's when you should contact Sparkman Law, specializing in litigating and defending complex and severe cases of parental alienation. Contact Shazia Sparkman, founder and managing attorney of Sparkman Law. Learn more at sparkmanlawfirm.com. Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, has two important email addresses you can use to reach us to request prayers for your family or to suggest a subject matter you would like to see covered on the Family's Divided TV program. To request prayer for your family, please email us at prayersforfamilies at gmail.com. Is there a subject you would like covered on Families Divided? If so, then send your email to requestsforfamiliesdividedtv at gmail.com. We are here to help you in your journey. Often, it's not just a parent and a child that are victims of alienation. Grandparents become frequent victims, too. Not long ago, Lori Schneider, an alienated mother, sat down with her mother, Vita Kaplan, to talk about a brief visit she had with her granddaughter after not seeing her for years. My name is Lori Schneider, and this is my mother, Vita Kaplan. And I am the mom of a 27-year-old, almost 28-year-old this month, um, alienated daughter. She's the younger of my two children. And I'm not alienated from my older child, my son. We have actually have a very close relationship. Okay. Hi, I called Cassie and on the yes. voicemail. And she happened to have picked up the phone. And I said, Cassie. Um, haven't talked to you for a very long time, but I would love uh, to talk to you. She said, I can't talk to you now. I'm busy working on my master's degree. I said, okay, well, we'll talk again. And then I hung up the phone and about, oh, a uh, um, few months, couple yeah, months. Yeah, it happened to have been on a Tuesday. July the 8th, and I said, uh, hello. And you had a knock person, at your door. Yes, and the person said, it's Cassie. They said, Cassie, I'm thinking, okay, I looked out the window, and there was Cassie standing there. I opened the door, mm -hmm. and Cassie came in. We hugged, and then she said, I have a little something for you. I said, okay, I'll open it. And there was a beautiful picture, a framed picture of Cassie and uh, her, her husband, husband Matt, now Matt. Wedding, Matt. wedding picture. Yeah, it was a wedding picture, beautiful. And then we both sat down and I said, how are you, Cassie? And she said, I'm fine, Nana. And then mm -hmm. she said, I, I was concerned about you. I didn't like the way your voice sounded on, on the voice of uh, male. male. Mm -hmm. And so I came by to see how you work. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And then we talked and I said, you know, Cassie, I think you ought to talk to your mother. And she loves you so much. I know she wants to hear from you and even to see you. And she said, well, she said, she, she said well, she said, I'm, I'm not here to talk about her. Right. <laughs> That's what she said. Yeah. I'm not here to talk about her because she chose Michael, her second husband, over, over her or over me. That's what Cassie said. Mm -hmm. She's a high school math teacher, and her husband is a pilot mm -hmm. at uh, the airport. Mm -hmm. And okay. after I heard all yeah. of that. And then she had a cat. Has then, a cat I, and a yeah, then I said, uh, a cat. Oh, oh, I, she has Elvis, a cat. <laughs> and then she has a new dog. And uh, 
that sounded good. And it sort of means that when Matt is away because yeah. he's flying, that she has the animals to keep her company. Yeah. She was always an animal lover too, right? That is true. Yeah. She always was mm -hmm. an animal lover. Mm -hmm. So she she got this dog just recently. This psychologist that I used to see, and she would always say to me, you have to keep chipping away at the wall. And she said, little pieces, bit by bit. And that stuck with me. And I and, and I text her and I write letters and um, I've had help writing a letter um, with Dr. Amy Baker that was so helpful to me. And um, and and I text and I and I send I send loving messages too. And again, you know, from from her point of view and being empathic to how she feels and never making it about myself. So I you know, so who knows, maybe one day we, we all have to have hope and, and we're really hoping that that this can maybe bring some peace to everybody. And, you know, because no one ever knows. No one has a crystal ball. But, but mom, you said she kind of looks the same. Huh? She looks the same. <laughs> and I still see that little girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But she does. She does look the same. And, she looks uh, good. And we're glad she's happy, right? Absolutely. That's what we raise them for. Right. I felt that it was um, something really good, positive, of course, moving in the right direction. I was very happy she came to see my mother. Um, I won't tell your age unless you don't care. I don't care. You don't care. Okay, she's almost 87. And um, so, she you know. January. Yeah. So, you know, you never know. And, and it was good, a good thing that she came and, and I was very, very happy about that. So, um, and I know, I know you were too. Oh, I was so happy to see her. Yeah. I hope I'll see her again. Yeah. And then our conversation was about over. She said she had to leave mm -hmm. and I opened the door. You she hugged and kissed. Yes, too, we you? did hug and kiss. Yeah. And then we, and she said, what did you say to her? I, I certainly hope you'll come again, Cassie. Maybe you'll bring Matt with you. Mm -hmm. And then she left and I stayed by the door and I saw her drive away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Join us next week on Families Divided, when our guest will be Dr. Alan Blotke, who will be talking about the voice of the alienated child. Remember, you can always explore more on our website, familyaccess.info, where you'll find details about upcoming events and much more information about the sad issue of family alienation.